So when you think of the word con man or con artist, there's probably a few people who immediately spring to mind. Bernie Madoff, obviously, who ran the world's largest Ponzi scheme. There's Charles Ponzi, the man who the Ponzi scheme is named after. Um, Frank Abagnale, the man whose life was uh, depicted in Catch Me If You Can. Maybe the Wolf of Wall Street, uh, Jordan Belfort. He might spring to mind as, a, as, a, as an infamous con man. Now, I would suggest all of those names are very well recognised con artists and for very good reasons. And there are many, many other con men, but none of them quite stick in people's collective consciousness is the way that those do. Today, I'm going to talk about a different kind of con man. Someone who's not conning for petty reasons, such as money, because they can. Someone who's conning someone not just because they dislike them, but they, they fundamentally hate everything about that person. And this is one of the stories from history that I think is the, the single greatest con man. Um, and the con he ran in many ways was, was ethical. He wasn't defrauding individuals of, of hard-earned money for his personal gain. Rather, he conned the Nazis. The man I'm going to talk about is called Juan Pujol Garcia, but more commonly known as Garbo. So most people have probably never heard of Juan Garcia. Um, But he's one of the single most influential people of World War II. After growing to detest all forms of political extremism during the Spanish Civil War, he naturally sided with, with Britain after the onset of World War II, as quickly it became the only country that was still standing against the Nazi war machine. He decided he could make his contribution to the war effort for the good of humanity, by spying for Britain against Germany. However, this wasn't as easy as he thought it would be at first. In 1941, he tried three times to contact British authorities in Lisbon and Madrid, offering his services to them, and each time he was rebuffed. But that wasn't going to stop him from contributing to the war effort, because he was on a mission for the good of humanity. It's his words, not mine. So instead of spying for Britain, he just decided to take matters into his own hands and he decided to become an independent spy. He fabricated the identity as a fanatically pro-fascist government official who could regularly travel to London on official business. His first con was to convince a printer that he actually worked for the Spanish embassy in Lisbon and get them to make him a diplomatic passport. He offered the services of this fabricated official to the Germans, claiming he wanted to perform his fascist duty by spying for them while he was in London. His plan was to become a German spy and then offer his services to Britain, hoping his new position within the Reich would sway them to finally accept his services. He contacted a German military officer in Madrid, codenamed Frederico. They immediately accepted his services and gave him a crash course in espionage, a bottle of ink, £600 for expenses, and told him, travel to Britain, set up a network of agents to spy for the Nazis. His uh, German codename was Arabel. So he had his orders, and instead of doing that, he moved to Portugal. He spent time in both Lisbon and Estoril, and went to the library. He used the library's Blue Guide to England, numerous reference books, magazines, a couple of maps, and concocted a series of impressive and convincing reports that convinced the Germans they had an agent in London. He quickly began setting up an impressive network of fictitious agents, he made a few mistakes along the way, as you might expect for someone who'd never actually set foot in Britain, um, such as being unable to get his head around the pre-decimalisation pound and claiming that his contact in Glasgow would do anything for a litre of wine. See, now is the point when things start to go from the ridiculous to the sublime. The British had intercepted some of his communications to the Germans. Even they found them so credible 
the MI5 launched a full-scale spy hunt to try and root out the Nazi agent. Luckily for them, it wasn't long before Garcia would make himself known to Britain and began doing some of his best work. See, the British had a suspicion that someone was playing games with the Germans already. After they'd ended up tracking the German Navy running around in circles trying to find a fictitious convoy that Garcia had informed them of. In April 1942, Britain finally accepted the help of Garcia, moved him and his family over to London, and um, induced him into the Double Cross program. He was initially codenamed Bovril, and then this was quickly changed to commemorate his position as the greatest actor in the world, and he was named after Greta Garbo, and Agent Garbo was born. All in all, Garbo and his handler would write 315 letters addressed to a German-controlled postbox in Lisbon. His fictitious spy network was so efficient and detailed, each letter averaging about 2,000 words, that the Germans didn't bother to recruit any more agents in Britain. The information that Garbo was providing them alone was overwhelming for them. All in all, they created a network of 27 agents, each of whom had a full life story. A Venezuelan living in Glasgow, a turncoat American army sergeant, and someone of high rank within the Ministry of Information. To create a convincing network, each agent had a unique life and character, and these were proved to be crucial in providing excuses as to why the agents hadn't reported key information in a timely fashion. Uh, for example, his agent in Liverpool fell ill just before a major fleet movement and was unable to report it. This agent fell so ill they ended up dying, and a real obituary was printed in the local newspaper. The Germans were so convinced by this, they ended up paying his widow a pension, and I think she was eventually also recruited into the network. Another clever tactic used by Garbo was to provide legitimate, actionable intelligence, but just not post the letter until after it would be useful to the Germans. The, the letters would be postmarked with an incorrect date, and the Germans would simply think it got delayed in the post. After providing the Germans delayed intelligence about the Navy leaving for the Mediterranean to take part in Operation Torch, Garbo received a response. We are sorry they arrived too late, but your last reports were magnificent. Not only was Garbo giving the Germans false information, but once the letters were received in Lisbon, they would be radioed up the chain of command after being encrypted with the Enigma machine. Having both the original message and the encrypted message gave the British codebreakers at Bletchley Park invaluable information about that day's Enigma settings. But Garbo's biggest deception was still to come. In January 1944, the Germans informed Garbo they had suspicions that the Allies were planning an all-out invasion of Europe. They instructed him and his agents to keep their eyes peeled and inform them of any developments they noticed. The Germans were obviously right, the Allies were in the middle of planning Operation Overlord and the D-Day landings. But they were also planning Operation Fortitude, a campaign of disinformation to confuse the Germans about the location, timing and scale of the invasion. And this would be Garbo's crowning achievement. The plan was simple. First, they would need to convince the Germans that the invasion wouldn't happen on the Normandy beaches, but in the Pas de Calais, causing defending forces to be out of position once the landing began. The next part of the plan was to convince the Germans that the landings in Normandy were a mere distraction to lure defending forces out of the way so the real landing can take place in Calais. The Allies constructed an elaborate jigsaw puzzle, with each agent providing mere snippets of information that were almost meaningless without being viewed in the context of the snippets provided by other independent sources. A ghost army, the first US Army group comprising 150,000 men with inflatable planes and inflatable tanks, was invented and stationed in Kent and Essex, just over the channel from the Pas de Calais and well distanced from the real invasion force that was further to the west. To further convince the Germans, Garbo would inform them to stand by for an urgent communication at 3am June the 6th, D-Day. He was to inform them of information from his agent in Southampton that the invasion was to begin. Troops had been issued with embarkation kits, sick bags, and they were on the move. What they hadn't planned for was that the German radio operator essentially missed the message 
and it wasn't until five hours later that the Germans realised what they had missed, giving Garbo immense credibility. Garbo responded to them, I cannot accept excuses or negligence. Were it not for my ideals, I would abandon the work. Garbo had constructed a beautiful deception, and three days later, he would place the cherry on top. He sent a very long message about a meeting he'd just had with his top agents. He pointed out that the first US Army group hadn't mobilised yet, and thus the Normandy invasion should be considered a mere diversion, and the main assault was yet to come. German High Command accepted this so completely they kept two armoured divisions, 19 infantry divisions in Calais, rather than using them to reinforce Normandy. And two months after D-Day, there were more troops stationed in Calais than there had been on D-Day. They were awaiting the real invasion that was never going to come. Post-war examination of the German records showed that at least 62 of Garbo's updates during this period were included in the German command's intelligence summaries. Garbo's communications over this period only enhanced his reputation with the Germans, and in late July Hitler himself awarded Garbo an Iron Cross, an honour usually reserved for the frontline heroes, meaning he's one of the very few and potentially the only person to be decorated by both sides of World War II. Ultimately, Germany would spend over $300,000 supporting the Garbo network but the true cost to them was much higher than that. Towards the end of the war, after D-Day, there was a little bit more hijinks that he was involved in. Um, there was a scare where they thought he'd been discovered as a double agent. They fabricated his arrest so that he had some excuses as to why he hadn't been reporting as regularly or as accurately. And he ended up going to Africa to fake his death. Um, lots of other stuff. He ended up in South America. But ultimately... His deception was never discovered, and to this day he is one of, if not the most successful, double agent ever. So there we have it, an almost unbelievable story of deception, an ethical con. And, in my opinion, a story that just isn't as well known as it deserves to be. There have been attempts to make films of his story over the years, but none have been successful. And I think one of the problems is that the story is almost too unbelievable. Um, but I hope you've enjoyed hearing about it as much as I enjoyed learning about it. So this is my first attempt ever at making a, a real video. Um, and I'd love to hear your feedback about it. So until next time. So